Assalamu alaikum everyone. First, I would like to thank Nisa Helpline for the invitation for today's presentation. As you guys all know, these are difficult and very unpredictable times, especially for people who have lost their jobs, people whose family members have been impacted by the virus, for women who are in domestic violence situation. Nisa Helpline is doing great work. It is tough sometimes to reach out and share your problems and concerns with families and friends. Nisa offers 24 seven free services for these people to provide emotional support and guidance. This helpline is to assist in supporting, helping in creating a plan of action for the best possible solutions. Nisa relies on your generous donations to continue to offer these much needed services in the community. Please donate to Nissa Helpline. Before I start, let me just introduce myself. As you know, um, I am associated with a nonprofit organization, Islamic Family Social Services Association. It's called IFSA in short. I've been with the association for the last 13 years and I presently serve as the clinical director. By profession, I am a registered psychologist and have been providing counseling within the community for the last 10 years. Just to kind of share with you a little bit about the organization IFSA, it's a nonprofit organization and it started about 30 years ago uh, out of Edmonton by a few community members with a small food bank. However, today it is one of its kind organization in Canada with 20 plus staff providing multitude of programs like essential needs program. We have second largest food bank depot in the city catering to about 5,000 individuals and families per month. Mental health support, outreach, family support, newcomer refugee support. We have a youth program called the Green Room. It got an award as well. Then we, our second largest program is our domestic violence program, um, which is uh, funded uh, provincially. Then we also offer education and psychotherapeutic groups trainings and workshops. In December last year, we started a helpline for information about community resources and support. So do please check our website, ifsa.ca, to check all the services that we offer. So today, my topic of uh, presentation will be anxiety in children. Overview of my presentation is initially I'll be talking about what are the general symptoms of anxiety, specifically in children, different kinds of anxiety and how it starts. And then in the end, I will be discussing different strategies to deal with anxiety in your children. Anxiety can be defined as fear of the unknown, like adults, Children also get anxious in unpredictable situations. For example, if you are moving to a new town, of course, the house will be different, new school. So there may be unsurety how the new teacher is going to be, if they are able to make new friends or not. So that unpredictability causes the fear, which leads to anxiety. Now, anxiety symptoms can be physical, it can be through thoughts, emotions, as well as behaviors. Physical symptoms that we see in anxiety can be increase in heart rate, rapid breathing, sweating, muscle tension, stomach ache, which can lead to nausea as well. In terms of thoughts, they'll have concurrent thoughts of being scared and just generally scared about everything. In emotions, uh, anxiety can come off as being angry. In very young children, they may become clingy, crying without a reason, throwing a tantrum, 
getting upset easily, behaviors can be sleeping poorly, having dreams and then waking up. Children can sometimes start to wet bed as well. And then just becoming quieter than usual in some cases. Common types uh, of anxiety in children, we see separation anxiety and then social anxiety. So separation anxiety can be someone being very anxious and upset when parted from their parents, caregivers or other loved ones. So for example, when a child starts a daycare, going to a new school, play dates. So the thought that's going on in the children's mind when they're going through separation anxiety is that bad things may happen to their loved ones while separated. Example, if a parent had to leave home for some time due to work. Then in the next anxiety is social anxiety. As the name implies, it's, it's of course in social situations and often it is related to performance anxiety. So whenever a child in social situations, they can be anxious, but then it can also be in school environment when they are asked to read in front of everyone, they are asked to do a presentation in front of other classmates. They are um, concerned that the children may make fun of them and um, it may lead to an embarrassing incident as well if the child continues to be anxious in social situations now as i said earlier that uh, anxiety producing uh, can be produced uh, different reasons uh, it can be biological which means that there is a family history. It can be a second. It can be environmental factors. For example, uh, the parents may be anxious. Anxious parents raise anxious children. There may be unpredictability in the surroundings. Children grew up in refugee camps. They're coming from war-torn countries. Uh, in regards to current situation, there may be a lot of unpredictability in children's mind in regards to when their schools are going to be reopened. And this all leads to anxiety. Psychological factors may be just their temperament, again, leading to a history of anxiety in their family. Also, they can be troubling early childhood experiences. The parents uh, got divorced, there was conflict in the home which can lead to psychological factors leading to anxiety and depression. Now, just to make the distinction, anxiety is not always bad. There it is, uh, it can be good as well. Usually a little anxiety is normal uh, in, in children and adults because it provides us motivation to complete tasks. For example, these days children have started school, they're getting their homework and assignments to complete at home. Some children may be in a very relaxed mode and not complete work on the assignments, while others may feel anxious and responsible that they have to finish in time. So that's all good as anxiety. Excessive anxiety is when it interferes with our day-to-day -day activities. So in children, if they are anxious going to school, playing with friends, attending, for example, a swimming or a karate class. So then definitely the parents, they need to connect with a professional like the child's pediatrician or a mental health therapist. Because if this anxiety continues, it can really affect their uh, child development and hinder the child's progress in other ways, academically, socially etc so let's talk about some of the interventions that you could use or in other words strategies that you can apply helping your child deal with their anxiety so the first thing is rather than trying to eliminate anxiety 
we have to teach the child to manage it. Okay. And the, the first thing is that you start to have a conversation with the child when you see the symptoms. So um, once you start conversation and you have to uh, maybe help the child in how to express those feelings. Research tells us that children, it's very difficult for children to voice their feelings. Often they show it through their behavior. So if they're crying a lot, they're getting angry, they're throwing tantrums, then we have to sit down and explore with them what is actually happening. Okay. Ask them to identify where they are feeling the anxiety and actually name that feeling. So for example, if they are having consistent stomach aches, so ask the child to name that stomach ache if it's becoming regular. So for example, the child names it grumpy. Okay. So then what you are trying to do is actually you are turning the feeling into a thing. Okay. And you're making it a reality that that is there. If something is there and you are accepting it and the child is accepting it, then of course you can try to come up with a solution on how to manage it. While you are trying to manage your child's anxiety, of course, you have to explore what is it that is actually causing that anxiety. So to decrease it or to remove the stressor from their life. Another thing is it is very important that once you start to notice those symptoms, you do not delay or avoid responding to anxiety. Often I have seen um, clients who have come to me and say, you know what, I have talked to my parents about these feelings and they say, oh, you're, you're too young to have anxiety or depression. So they don't feel validated. So the important thing is that once you start to have these conversations with the child, and you start to um, have these conversations, it helps the child to think about them and then learn different ways to deal with it. So coming back to the uh, delay or the avoiding part, what it does is if we start to avoid a certain feeling, it's a, it's a short-term solution, okay? but it increases over time. It may escalate even. So as I said before, if a child starts to show symptoms that I have mentioned earlier, okay, rather than just taking her out of that situation or just negating that it is not there, okay, we have to teach the child to manage it. That is actually the key to managing anxiety. If you avoid it, and if you tell your child to avoid it, this will become a coping mechanism for the child. Okay, and the child will not learn to deal with it. And then it will become a cycle, just pushing it down all the time. Now, also, when you are teaching your child to manage it, one thing is you have to let them know that this is a reality, what they are feeling. You can't tell a child uh, or promise the child that these fears are unrealistic. So for example, if the child is anxious about a test, okay, you can't say that he won't fail a test. I mean, this is life. He, he or she is going to come across um, situations that are difficult, that are hard to deal with. Okay. And the important thing is that we express confidence that it is going to be okay. It will pass. Even if he fails the test, one thing that he's going to learn is what to do, okay, different next time. So he can pass the test. 
And once the child sees that you have confidence in the in child that he can deal with it, I tell you, it will reduce the anxiety in the child. Okay. Another strategy is when you are talking to the child is that you have to respect your child's feeling. Okay. But do not empower them. So what that means is when you are listening to the child, you have to validate the feelings. But that does not mean you have to agree with them. So for example, if they are terrified about going to the doctors, okay, because the your child is due for a shot, you don't want to belittle her fears, but you also don't want to amplify them. You want to listen and be empathetic, help her understand what she's anxious about, and encourage her to feel that she can actually face her fears. The message you want to send to the child is, I know you're scared and that's okay. I'm here and I'm going to help you get through this. Another thing is we have to try not to ask them leading questions. So, of course, we want to encourage them to talk about their feelings, but not to ask or say, are you anxious about the big test? Are you anxious about going to the doctor? Rather than saying that, if you word it as, how are you feeling about the test tomorrow? How are you feeling about going to the doctors tomorrow? So asking them open-ended questions. Okay, So that helps avoid reinforcing the anxiety. What you don't want to do is with your tone, voice, or body language, say as if maybe this is something that you should be afraid of. So for example, let's say a child has had a negative experience with a dog. So next time she's around a dog, you might be anxious about how she will respond. And you might unintentionally send a message that she should indeed be worried about uh, another experience with the dog. So it's important that we don't ask leading questions. Then another thing is when we are teaching them to manage their anxiety, to tolerate their anxiety, provide them with consistent encouragement. Let your child know that you appreciate the work that it takes to tolerate anxiety in order to do what the child is trying to do or needs to do. Because it really encourages him to engage in life and to let the anxiety take its natural curve. Okay. We call it the habituation curve. It will drop over time as he continues to have contact with the whatever is causing uh, anxiety, the stressor. It might not drop to zero, it might not drop as quickly as you would like, but that's how we get over fears. But when we are afraid of something, the hardest time is really before we do it. Okay. So it is important that we encourage our child okay, to manage their anxiety, provide, keep providing them with encouragement when they are doing it, but then also try to keep it really short, the exposure to the stressor. So going back, if you if the child is anxious about going to the doctor, so just keep it short. As soon as they get the, uh, their uh, injection, um, just leave the doctor's clinic. Another thing is while you are talking to the child about their anxiety, it is important that you think things through. Having a plan always reduces the uncertainty in a healthy, effective way. So have a plan with your child. That's also part of managing anxiety. Okay. So for example, because, because that fear can actually come true. So it helps to talk through what would happen if the child's fear came true. How would she handle it? So for example, um, it, there might be a worry 
with the child that what would happen if the parent doesn't come to pick her up one day after school. So then you sit down and you start to make a plan with the child. So if the father or the mother doesn't come at the end of the school to pick them up, what would they do? Okay. Well, I would go and tell my teacher that my mom is not here. And what do you think the teacher would do? Well, then she would call the mom. Okay, or she would wait with the child. So just think things out because what you're doing is you're also actually teaching the child to come up with solutions when they are um, in, 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 a, in a problem or, or if they face an issue. And when we sit down and talk with them, ladies, we are also giving confidence to our child that they can make that decision. We can also come up, for example, with a code word with the child. For a child who's afraid that a stranger might be sent to pick her up, decide a code word that the child can ask for when someone different comes to pick, pick the child up. One thing that is very important is that as parents, we are role models for our children. So the way we model our own emotions, okay, that's giving cue to the children how they have to be. And kids are very perceptive. They are going to take it in if you are anxious. So for example, if, if they hear you complaining on the phone to a friend that you can't handle the stress or the anxiety, of course, that's the message that you are telling, giving to the children. So you don't have to pretend that you're not anxious, okay? This is also part of being realistic, being a role model that we have to teach our children that we also go through stress. We may be anxious as well, okay? But then this is how we have to deal with it, okay? But then we have to tell them in a calm manner, okay? Because it is very important that Children learn how we are dealing with our own emotions. Now that we have talked a few strategies on how to deal with anxiety in children, another good news is that there are certain foods that help us control anxiety. And uh, I would suggest adding those foods to your regular diet. So first of all, foods that are naturally rich in uh, magnesium and zinc, zinc, these are both our metals, help a person to feel calmer. So examples of foods that are rich in magnesium may be leafy green vegetables like spinach and uh, foods that may be uh, rich in zinc are walnuts they may be pumpkin seeds oats fish like salmon avocado these are all food that are rich in magnesium and zinc and it helps the person to reduce their anxiety now another kind of food um, is uh, foods that are rich in antioxidants that are called antioxidants. So just to define, antioxidants are man-made or natural substances that may prevent or delay some type of cell damage. So they may be in our uh, body or we made them uh, from outside, but they help us with delaying some types of cell damage and research suggests that one way to improve anxiety is to increase the food rich in antioxidants in our diet and these may be beans different kind of fruits like apples prunes cherries plums then again nuts green leafy vegetables and then importantly, spices like ginger and turmeric. 
you know, I come from the South Asian background and we use a lot of turmeric in the foods that we cook. So try to add these to your diet just regularly. It doesn't have to be that if your child or you are feeling anxiety, then only you need to eat it. I would um, strongly suggest, and I talk to my clients regularly who are um, go going through anxiety to um, regularly uh, be uh, cognizant of the food that they are eating and to eat uh, food that is rich in um, antioxidants or magnesium and zinc. Another thing that ha research has told us is that it is very important that people who are going through anxiety, they have a regular um, eating schedule. So often I have noticed, especially in teenagers, that they will skip their breakfast and they will have their first meal around 1 to 2 p.m. So one can imagine, you know, if they had their last meal at 6, 7 p.m. the night before and then they eat the next day at 12 or 1 p.m., how long the stomach did not get any nutrition, the body did not get any nutrition. And then, of course, using that nutrition, there are so many chemical reactions that take place in our body, which result in producing the required chemicals that the body needs to continue to run the systems. So it is important that children who are uh, not eating regularly to at least have something in the morning, within the first hour when they wake up. It can be fruit, it can be yogurt, they don't need to have a full meal. So then their metabolism starts. Now, um, let me talk a little bit about children anxiety and the current situation with COVID-19. Now, as you all know, coping with the uncertainty around COVID-19 is challenging for most adults. So, of course, kid, kids may be having an even tougher time during this pandemic. There is social isolation there off from school for an extended period of time. They don't know when they're going to see their friends again, have PE, gymnastics, enjoy all those things, go back to their classes. And um, this is important that parents have conversations with their children about the this unpredictability of the present time. Now, it is also important that both parents are on board with what is being discussed with the child. And different messages coming from one parent to another can confuse them and possibly make the child more worried. As I said before, that parents are the role model and how we manage our own anxiety is giving cues to the child. So this is very important that first we try to manage our own anxiety, think of the right words and language before you go and talk to a child. Sit together, husband and wife, discuss first how it will be related to the child, especially families where the parents have lost their jobs, they are worried about their finances. There may be family members who are impacted by COVID-19 as well. So it is important that when we are talking to our children, we talk to them in age appropriate language. Okay. And then if the parents are um, feeling really anxious due to the unpredictability and due to other stresses related to finances or illnesses, then do please check with a mental health professional because your health matters the most. In regards to talking to the children in regards um, about the current situation, in, in, in first thing is uh, there is this constant news feed that's coming up and then there is information overload. So your child may be confused or unsure of what is really going on around, around them. 
Ask them first when you are sitting down with them, what do they know? And what are their worries in regard to the current situation? So when you sit with them, open the dialogue with them, you can maybe have a family meeting. Okay, so sit down with them, ask them, what do they know about the situation? What are their worries? What they want to know? Don't be afraid to talk about it. And make sure you talk about and if there are any myths around this current illness. It's okay to provide them with reassurance during this time. Don't be afraid or hesitant to tell your child that you have some anxiety around the situation as well. Normalize their worries by helping them know that it's okay and healthy to be worry to worry a little and it keeps us safe but we never want to let the worry take over and become unhelpful now if they do want to know more about the the virus covid-19 you can let them know that right now you don't have all the answers right now but let's talk about what you do know so doctors and scientists are studying to learn more about this virus so they can help us figure out the best way to beat it so far we know that to help beat it we can wash our hands after we blow our noses cough sneeze go to the bathroom before we eat or when we come home from being outside but we need to wash them for at least 20 seconds so let's come up with a hand washing song together so this is how you'll have your conversation in a very simple language with what you can share with them. Also these days, uh, Ramadan is uh, coming up next week. It is the month that Muslims recharge. This is uh, again, this is going to be an opportunity for you. This is a special time of the month that you can assign a time actually to sit together and have a family meeting where you can uh, first pray and then you can start to have conversations with your children around their anxiety about their uncertainties about the situation because it needs to be an ongoing discussion that needs to take place regularly think of having your children at home not as something um, that is a challenge for you but think of it as an opportunity where you can sit down together especially in the month of ramadan pray together have conversations that you never had with them before this think of this time as an opportunity where you can actually talk about things that you would never have before about their feelings, about their emotions. Okay? You can also share your own emotions. In this way, you are teaching your child to become confident about how they are feeling and then to teach them to express those feelings. So this brings us to the end of our presentation today. So in conclusion, just want to kind of summarize what we learned today is we I talked about how to talk to your child so they can manage their anxiety better we talked about a few strategies that you can use when you are teaching your child to uh, manage their anxiety I also mentioned if it is excessive anxiety if it is um, hindering their daily routine day-to-day -day activities then definitely they need to, uh, you need to uh, connect with your family doctor or child's pediatrician or a psychotherapist. Then also um, we talked about some strategies, as I mentioned, uh, to help your child manage anxiety. And then uh, lastly, anxiety in view of the COVID-19 situation, how you need to engage your child in conversation, how both the parents need to be on the same page, how uh, the information in regard to COVID-19 need to be shared with the children in simple language and words. 
So I hope that today's presentation increased your knowledge and it will help you in dealing with anxiety in your children. Please uh, do remember us in uh, your prayers in the coming month of Ramadan and do remember to support Nisa Healthline and donate generously. Thank you so much.